I was educated in a moment where drawing was everything. And we had very little connection to materiality. Um, we made the odd model, which is completely different than what you see me doing here, right? But it was a representational model of a spatial or formal condition without any relationship to construction. And uh, this problem, this vacuum, this atrophy resulted in a pendulum swing towards the completely the other end. And precisely because design was centered around um, typological and spatial issues, never material, it also meant that you know the courses that you focused on were in design studio, but building technologies was off to the side somewhere. There's something in the pedagogies of you know Rodolfo Machado at the time where he was able to communicate in us the idea that materiality is not just about construction. The the language of construction. Uh, that is about tectonics uh, is not only as important as the structure, but it is actually everything. You design the structure around the tectonics. So this inversion, this conceptual inversion is a central part of this argument, whereby you realize that the skin of a building or the, 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 what, it, what it's clothed in is the architecture and it plays an ambivalent role. Sometimes it's structural, sometimes it's supported by the structure, some, sometimes it oscillates between those two. And so, long story short, we realized in our generation that materiality isn't the byproduct of other kinds of intellectual investigations. It is at the core of it. And so the early projects that you see us take on where there's a smoothing of the brick walls that are undulating or the Western house with the corrugated wall that is the threshold between the living room and the garden. All of these are exercises, not necessarily in materiality. They start with materiality to demonstrate that their pliability, their malleability, malleability is the prerequisite for spatial and formal uh, connectivities between one space and another. And that, in a way, you couldn't do that without an understanding of materials. The second discovery was also that, um, you know, the modules of, a, uh, of an extruded uh, sheet metal are fundamentally different than the size of a brick. And so, whether you have an aggregate notion of construction or a smooth one, that the medium through which that is explored and ultimately expressed is through the strict module that you're working. So that, again, it is the, uh, the catalytic detail, the, the critical detail that is the prerequisite for uh, exploration and not the end point necessarily. And finally, that if you accept this as a premise, and if you understand this, we discovered much later in our careers, the legal edifice that lies behind this, is that architects, for the most part, are, are tasked with the responsibilities of design intent, but not the means and methods of construction. And that is an artificial separation if you think about it from a, an educational point of view. If we, of all people, are not tasked with the responsibility of exactly how uh, m materials are detailed and how they're put together and how what, wh where the labor goes behind it, we're missing some key part of our thinking. And so much of that early work, as it does today, revolved around taking responsibilities over means and methods uh, that uh, is not part of the legal definition of our responsibilities.
because you know the instruments of urban planning and design more often than not revolve around uh, zoning uh, uh, zoning definitions, uh, setbacks, heights, uh, parameters, constraints, codes, and they're abstractions, but they produce envelopes for buildings. And they're not about materials, fundamentally. They may actually cast shadows on materials down the road as you go in front of community boards and they establish criteria for how the base of the building should be materialized and you know it's urban design connections but the reality is that uh, plan the planning dimension has a much more interesting relationship with the law than it does with materiality and uh, for that reason uh, at that scale, I became much more interested in political phenomena that we now associate with gerrymandering and redlining because all of a sudden you realize that there are, you know, hundreds of bylaws out there that appear to be irrational and even ephemeral but they describe the social geography of the, the built landscape in ways that are incendiary if you think about architecture's role in them. On the other hand, if you think about the role of products in industrial design, the classic division is between uh, the design of the casing and the mechanics of what's inside of it whether it's your camera or whether it's the phone or, or any other thing that we, the, there is a, an ethic that says that, you know, the vessel is, is, the, is an expression of its contents. Uh, and of course, there's another philosophy that says that uh, the design of the vessel has its own autonomy and the mechanics of what, what lays behind it is basically taxidermic. It's just a stuffing. And, uh, and uh, well, anyway, we haven't done many industrial design products. We have done some, but the ones that we've done, uh, like the cutlery and uh, the silverware cases, all have a very delicate relationship with ergonomics, albeit a reinvented one. And so uh, that the, the relationship between figure and uh, the figure of the vessel, the figure of the piece, and the, the figure of the body uh, establish a, you know, a, a, a new fit that is a central part of the argument. Then at that middle scale, of course, uh, you know, questions of construction and materiality become much more vivid because they, they deal with all of the discussions of materiality that, that have to do with um, uh, aggregations and uh, the geometry is a mediating element between the unit and the larger space uh, and a variety of other conditions of delivery. You know, a brick you can do as a, a single person. A, a piece of stone is, you know, it used to be called a you know, two-man stone, a two-person stone. Uh, after a certain dimension, you need a forklift. And so all of a sudden, the, uh, the connection between uh, material and architectural expression is mediated through a different idea about labor. And so I think that uh, all of this discussion about materiality and these other scales come together by a redefinition of what are the critical means and methods of each of these different disciplines. So, and, and, and I would, I, sometimes I transport uh, the metaphor of means and methods to complete other disciplines. You know, so it, it, it's like uh, talking about perspective in painting. If you don't understand what a station point is, what vanishing points are, what a picture plane is, you, you don't understand the, the means and methods through which you can manipulate, uh, you know, the, the the rhetoric of a perspective. So, 
So I, I used and abused the, that term in many ways. But there's an interesting relationship between, uh, I suppose, materiality and the scales at which they're exercised in your question. And, and that's the tenuous link I'm trying to make. I'm not sure if I have an, a universal idea of space. But I can at least narrate something that we've done with space more than once that has become a spatial trope, which I still enjoy in its various you know, iterations. And it has to do with the introduction of a spatial slippage that is the result of a staircase or an element that would normally not be there. And the shift that that entails in plan produces a shift, a corollary shift in section. And that liminal space, that crack, has produced some of the more interesting discoveries uh, that we've made. Uh, you will see this in the New England house. You will see this in the senior center in Korea. You'll see this in the strange uh, staircase and landscape tuck in Villa Varois. But it's almost the same spatial trope exercised over and over and over again to see how we could radicalize it. And I guess um, to go back to your original question, this would mean that in some capacities our, our notion of space is totally generic initially. And it's, it's, it's a found object. Space is just a room. It's just a generic space. And uh, the interest in it comes through either hybridization, overlap, slippage, something, uh, an element, a program, a, a com recombination happens. Uh, and, and the reconciliation of these two parts results in this discovery. One of the earliest experiences I had was uh, as a child, uh, I was left the majority of my time in my aunt's house uh, because they actually had a house and a garden. We didn't, we just had an apartment. It's a modernist house with this large terrace whose only connection to the garden was this uh, long ramp, steep by today's standards but nonetheless accessible. And uh, it was framed by steel railings that were spatial in their, in their girth, a series of rings. And of course, when you're only two, three feet tall, you are embedded, enmeshed in that, in that steel framework. And it describes that, that kind of interstitial space that I was describing in your response about space. And, uh, and of course, this ramp as a child becomes the object of play because you're rolling down it, you are skating down it, you are kicking balls up it. And so, uh, whereas the garden is a completely conventional space and the terrace is a space for tea, the ramp became, uh, you know, the slippage that it produced was the, the place of play and discovery. Very important part of our practice uh, uh, revolves around diagrams, particularly those that are animated. Um, it's not that we don't have still diagrams. And they're, they're purely conceptual in their explanation of urban conditions or they're usually forensic in the sense that they are trying to expose things that would otherwise be concealed within a building. In other words, if you 
if you draw a building, you're ba more often than not, you're concealing all of its organs. So a diagram by definition for us is analytical in its decomposition of the organic closed form. It takes something apart to show something forensic. So you're, uh, there's something clinical about its dissection. Uh, and, and so in great part, our diagrams are, are, sh are showing uh, the kind of interstices of things and the mechanics of how they work. It's how the engine works, it's not what it looks like. Now, in the context of a lot of the diagramming that we do now, uh, we also set up conceptual bridges between one modality of thinking and a completely different one. And I'll try to take you through one of those sequences verbally, and, and later on you can sort of see it in animation. The diagram that we do of Villa Varroise in southern France starts with a plan, it's, it's all animation, starts with a plan that is generic, typologically generic, and then it distorts to describe the anomalies, the biases of the site plan, and how the plan, our floor plan, has to shift to respond to that. Just as you think you've understood it, the diagram rotates to reveal a section in axonometric to show that the site is not flat, but sloped. And it shows how our building, again, distorts to respond to a dominant view versus secondary and tertiary views. And again, you're, so from there, you're going from uh, an orthogonal projection to a plan oblique. And that's something you can do through an animation, but there, you know, otherwise you'd be doing them through two still images. And these are abstract stills. So they're, we went from line drawing to a gray figure, an abstract formal figure. Then the next sequence of the animation uh, shows the distortions of, on the body of this abstract chunk of concrete, which have to do with uh, things that the building has to do, uh, like the introduction of openings in the skylights to, to give views out, or the distortion of the building in accordance with the rake of a stair, those things that... Uh, those parts of the organs of the building which have an impact on the skin. You, you begin to see the building as not merely a figure or a sculpture, but as something that has a direct link to the infrastructure of its interior. And at this point, you're panning around, and here's like the critical moment. You're going from a plan oblique to a perspectival condition. These are two fundamentally different uh, modalities of representation. And by the time you reach the other end of the building, you're not only in perspective, but we're changing the lens of that perspective from 100 degrees to 75, to 55, to 45, and ending up eventually at 15. So it's a very distorted, wide-angle view at the end. And as you understand something that is now immersive and experiential, what, what was analytical and almost clinical originally, it's at that point that uh, the kind of the, the gray clinical diagram uh, evolves into a realist image where the material of the building, the landscape, and all of it is is rendered to, to full depiction. So all of this to say that in a way, all architectural representations are diagrams. Even the realist depiction is a diagram. Uh, they are projections of a reality that is yet to exist. Um, or they're projections of, a, of, a, of an intention that will never exist, um, or they're an alibi uh, for what you want to do. 
that gives it rhyme and reason. Um, but they articulate the self-consciousness uh, of, of a discipline that is in dire need of communication with a much broader audience. And, and the diagrams, all representation do this, but the, a diagrammatic thinking of, uh, of architecture uh, also understands a kind of deep responsibility of, of A, uh, the need for digging deeper into what we do, but even more so, uh, a critical need to communicate what we do, uh, not to each other, but to a much, much broader audience.